don't know whether the bugs in Philadelphia are the same. I'd be very afraid, in fact, we decided not to attempt to publish anything like this until we could be more scientific and figure out how to, we were afraid it would cause more damage than good, so I do not advocate this approach, but I don't want to be dishonest. Dr. Wallace, well, on the big three, my white blood cells dropped very low and my lips went up. Can the big three cause blood cell damage or can they cause lymphoma or blood cancers? Were you on Rapamipin? I was on Rapamipin, but now I've been off of it for seven months and my blood is really just, again, the new low, low white blood cells, high lymphs. And they're telling, now I'm thinking I need to go to a hematologist. In my experience, when the, when the drug level, when the drug disappears, um, your counts come back up. And now, uh, rifampin clearly can affect it. Platelets, which is a blood clotting element in the blood, has been more common in my experience. Um, but I, I would, the agree the, I would agree that the likely, you need to be investigated further. Um, that's a very unusual phenomenon, and it should correct yourself. I'd like to know what's so special about Tamitol. <laughs> Why can't it come out so you don't have to take, I don't know, depending on how much you weigh, four, five, six at a time, or break it down throughout the day, or whatever? I'm open to suggestions on this. The Tamitol pills, in case you don't know, are about the size of my thumb. So if you're taking four of those, not everybody can do that. And, and um, so if you're actually complaints about taking the medicine, that's the one we have the most amount. Now, we've always said that the cornerstone of therapy is a macrolide and a Tamitol. And if you can't tolerate the red medicines or pamphlet of microbutin with small amounts of disease, most of the patients that I've seen have gotten better just like they were on three drugs. Um, but regimens without the Tamitol have really, we really have had the drug to use. Now, I have a patient last week who got a horrific rash on the Tamitol, and even when we challenged, um, we discussed using inhaled amikacin as the alternative medicine. I mean, you're, you're trading big pills for irritated airways and coughing. So uh, there's not a good answer, and it's a good point. It's a, I mean, I wouldn't want to swallow one of those pills in my head. Dr. Peterson, your DHEA information was uh, very interesting. And I was wondering how can that be translated into a, a medication or a, a therapeutic uh, alternative for patients? How can we uh, measure that and then uh, give them a regimen that would help boost DHEA? Yeah, I can. I'll, I'll take that. The, uh, there's lots of DHEA supplements available, most of them in like GNC type stores, and they're not very regulated. So one of the things we would like to do is first publish this data in a peer review journal, get some opinions about it, and then maybe do a clinical trial of DHEA supplementation in patients who are also taking standard therapy. Uh, I, I guess we could do an arm of the trial, and I'd be interested in opinions on that of DHEA alone uh, to see if it makes any difference. But what's hard is following for results. Uh, that's the hard part of designing this kind of trial, getting the numbers of patients. Um, so I think we need more information about DHEA first and then we need a treatment trial to see. The good thing about DHEA, from what I understand about it, is people feel good on it. So it's not a hard sell to get people to take it. People often take it as a feel-good supplement. Um, but I think we need to do a lot more work on it. 